Welcome, everyone. I think we're going to make a start. My name is Beth Heiss. I'm Head of Interpretation and Exhibitions here at Sydney Living Museums. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this talk tonight, Kitchen, where technology meets creative expression, which is um, the penultimate in our series, Rooms in the House. Um, and next week, we will be looking um, at... Sorry, I've lost it in my notes. <laughs> other, rooms, other rooms, indeed. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people on whose land we meet today and express my respects for elders past and present. It is such a privilege for me today to be here to introduce these talks as I've spent quite a lot of my time the last two years thinking about kitchens, spending time in our nine historic kitchens while we've developed the uh, Eat Your History exhibition and interpretation program, which is now showing at the Museum of Sydney and all the different uh, events around our places. And while we've thought about what people did in kitchens and we've revived and revealed old food practices, um, it's been really a lot of fun for, for all of us. So I thought tonight would be a great opportunity and it just gives me such a pleasure to introduce our two very renowned expert speakers tonight. Before I do that, however, can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones on to silent, please? And I'll let you know that our talks tonight will be recorded and they'll be up on our website in the near future if you want to have a look or point one of your friends in that direction. So tonight we've got two speakers, Hannah Trive and Michael Bogle. Each will speak for 30 minutes and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So I'll start by introducing Michael, who's a great friend of this organization and a former curator here. Michael specializes in Australian architecture and design. His recent books include Design in Flight, a treatment of the Mark Newson design of the Qantas A380 Airbus interiors, and a book of essays called Designing Australia. He has a chapter on mid 20th century design of Sydney coffee shops and cocktail bars in a forthcoming book on the architecture of leisure and pleasure published by the University of New South Wales Press. Press excuse me. Michael has a PhD from RMIT School of Architecture and Design and is currently researching the development of the interior design profession in Australia. Please welcome Michael. Thanks very much. They had a funny title for a book, Architecture of Leisure and Pleasure. But they, they haven't actually decided what the topic is yet. <laughs> yeah. Look, my, my talk tonight is about kitchens, but I have to say, to sort of paraphrase Shakespeare and Mark Anthony, that I come really not to praise kitchens, but to bury them. So what I'm going to do is, is walk you through what I see as the evolution of the kitchen and make some very sharp pointers about where I think kitchens are going to go. And you may not agree with me, but don't be violent. <laughs> We have security here. <laughs> so I don't want you to run up and hit me. You, afterwards, you can say strong things to me, and I'll give you my email. <laughs> now, one of the things that, that I promised in, the, in my sort of prospectus for this talk was that I would reveal a new appliance. Because people are always saying, uh, a new appliance is as important to the, to the world as the, the discovery of a new star. This machine, this Habitat domestic appliance, can generate, if, when, when running, of course, four extra hours in every day. Think of that. You're trying to do everything you can in 24 hours. With this machine, you've got four extra hours every day. You don't have to use them, and you can't store them up. So first of all, we'll look at the issue of uh, what I call kitchen romanticism. This is where I think many people are lodged in the, the idea of the the hearth, the kitchen, the, the, the lovely home, it's spacious, it's, there's a separate kitchen, you go down a hall, uh, there's a big pantry, people are gathered around a table, mom might be cooking, dad might be cooking, or m m probably mom's cooking and dad's watching, and the children come in after school, they, they're hungry, they're fed, they come, they have Sunday dinner, the lovely family, the nuclear family, everything is good. Dinner is served, it's on the table. Preparation is taking place. Everyone helps with cleaning up. You linger around the table, you have an, have an extra glass of wine or champagne or cordial. 
It's great. It's lovely. However, there are other forces at work. One of them is the driving force of modernism, the reductive kitchen. We take the kitchen and all its functions and squeeze it. Well, why? We'll talk about that later. Maybe we can get to it. But the reductive kitchen is not a new idea. Here are three Australian blokes in a slab cottage in the late 19th century. You're looking straight into the face of a reductive kitchen. That long table is along the room. One end of it is used for food preparation. The other end is used for eating. Inside that, you can barely see it with this photograph. is a, a, a kettle hanging over the fire. The tableware nicely displayed on the mantle above. It's a very small kind of workable space. Where do you wash up outside? Food preparation takes, on the, it takes place on the end of that table. That's it. And, and the food service happens around it. You see this picture over and over again in, in 19th century homes of this type. Here's another one. One thing about Australians is that we are a reductive race. I speak here as a new Australian. But we, we like to make things simple. We're practical. And that's a very simple, practical kitchen you're looking at there. Three blokes standing around. Kitchen is really under that bit of slab and that bench that you see there. If we took the Silver Comet service to Broken Hill from Sydney, we'd probably be fed up in this bloke there. That's a reductive kitchen for sure. And you could see that the, the emphasis is simplifying, clarifying the space. The functions are all very, very plainly expressed. And they also they don't fall over. That's the other nice thing about things on trains. Falling over is another big issue on a boat. This is a 47-foot sailing yacht, a deller, and that's the kitchen. Again, a reductive thing. Produced more, more or less because of function. It's, re it's required to be reductive because the other space is for living, sleeping. Or this space. This is reductive almost by accident. You went eating at Claude's or no Claude's, the restaurant? Gone now. Sad. Gone. This is a picture of the last service. I don't know if you've ever seen their kitchen, but it's pretty small. <laughs> That's it. That's the kitchen. But I love this. Because if you've ever worked in a restaurant or in the kitchen, which I have, um, you can see that everyone in the kitchen is thinking toward going home. And it's the last service. The person is coming out with the last desserts. And the uh, cook staff are already cleaning up. See, they're scrubbing. They're getting ready to get the heck out of there. Now, simplifying kitchens. Here's a woman, uh, like a pioneer in many ways, uh, Louisa Lawson. She wrote an essay in, in her magazine, which she published herself, called The Dawn, published here in Sydney in 1892. She wrote a long essay about saving steps in the kitchen. So look, you know, we don't make these big kitchens. We have to walk here, walk there, and walk, you know, end up walking five kilometers to produce a meal. She says, oh, think about how you're designing the kitchen. Her son, Henry, I don't think he ever cooked a day in his life. He certainly drank every day of his life. But there are other people who do that too. But I just need to point out that, that, that Lawson is really a pioneer of that idea of simplifying the tasks in Australia. In America, for example, you've got Christina Frederick, who wrote a very famous book called Household Engineering, which is based on the work of this fellow over here, Frederick Winslow Taylor, who put out a book called The Principles of Scientific Management. And he talked about performing tasks and about how to clarify and simplify those tasks, how to get it done quicker, faster, not by faster motion, but by having things to hand, like in a boat or in a, in a train, getting things around where you need them. His book, and published in 1911, was in the Mitchell Library in the same year. It's still there. So at the Mitchell Library, they're ordering Frederick's book. Bang, it's here. People are reading it, putting it to work down the railway workshops. Polacco shirts, you ever heard of them? Remember Polacco? <clears throat> Maybe your grandfather wore them or your father. The nylons, the ones that turn yellow. And here's another pioneer of the reductive kitchen. There's this woman right in the center here called Magreta Shorta Lohotsky, a Viennese woman who studied at the School of Design and Handcraft in Vienna, 1919. Not quite finished with school yet. But when she does finish school, she get, gets caught up with a fellow called Ernst May. He's the director of housing in Frankfurt. And he 
producing a lot of housing, what we'd call housing commission houses. The Germans do this very well and seem to live in them very well. They're happy to be there. He gets her to design what, what's now known as the Frankfurt Kitchen, 1926. And this is it. This is a picture of one in the side itself. And it's not just one, but there are thousands of them, literally thousands of them. And they, and they are in museums all over the world. Shorta Lahotsky designs this, but she understands the task of cooking. I'll show you a kitchen in, in much better shape. This is from an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art last year, in which their Frankfurt kitchen was brought out and assembled. That's not a new kitchen. That's the kitchen that the cons conservation's done a job on. But these lovely little, uh, little slide-out things all have condiments in them. So they slide out, and then there's a pitcher on the end of them. So if you have rice in there, you pull it out, tip it out, and put, say, two cups of rice, you just pour it out that way. So all of those things have a little pouring spout in them. There's a stool there, and you can see there's a little thing for cleaning, taking food scraps on the right. So you're cutting board there, and you just rake it into there. And, and when you finish, you just pour it out and throw it away. And all these beautiful little pulls, stove, all carefully calculated, but based on ideas that uh, people like Miss Lawson and um, Christine Fredericks developed first. There are lots of these sort of reductive kitchens around. And all of them, in some way, draw on that long kind of galley kitchen that you see there, which I sort of associate with boats, but really doesn't belong there. Here's one I picked out of uh, Blade Runner. You know that film? It's not a very nice picture of the future, but, but Decker's not a very good housekeeper either. Now, this whole idea is picked up in 1927 in another German exhibition in Stuttgart. The curator is Mies van der Rohe. He said, well, this will look really interesting. Let's commission some houses. And in these houses, we'll put some kitchens. And this is the poster for it. And you can see what the attitude of this poster is about. The poster is called The Residence, Die Wohnung. And the big red X means we don't want any more of that. One of the kitchens designed in this uh, exhibition in uh, Stuttgart is called the Weisenhof Kitchen. You can see why it's called the White House Kitchen, or White House Exhibition. It's by a Dutchman called Oud. You always see this picture of uh, Oud's houses because it's, you think, gosh, isn't that neat? And I've often wondered why. Why do we always see the same picture over and over again? And I realized when I understood how the whole place worked, this is the pictures that architects take. They like this, this elevation, but it's actually the back door. That's the kitchen designed by Oud. Now I ask you, if you've spent any time in the kitchen, what do you think about this as a kitchen idea? That work for you? What is it? What's missing? Cupboards. Cupboards. Storage. Storage. <laughs> Where's the food? <laughs> There's not much there, is there? I see a few little condiment pans up there, but that's pretty spare, isn't it? Do you think Mr. Al does a lot of cooking? <laughs> Probably not. This is why we always see the same picture of Al's. Uh, a block of flat or units. This is the front. Modernism doesn't like a mess. But this is how people live, but that's not what modernism likes. Modernism likes that. That's the picture that gets taken. Too messy. Modernism is tidying, it's about tidying. Now, after this Stuttgart exhibition and the, and the Frankfurt kitchens, which have been widely accepted, in 1931 they have another exhibition uh, called the German Building Exhibition in Berlin. Who goes to this? Sidney Anker. He goes there, looks at everything. He's very inspired by Mies van der Rohe, but he's not inspired by the kitchens he sees there because he never really made a, what you call a, a classical modernist kitchen. But a woman was exhibiting there called Lily Reich, and she did a kitchen for an apartment, and here it is. This is an apartment kitchen called a cooking cupboard. And which is, you open that up, and inside is everything you need, and you close it up, and you're back in your studio flat. Very clever. Very clever. Germans don't mind living in flats. And in Germany, in uh, developed flats, you, when you move, you get to take your kitchen with you. you. You design your kitchen, you build it in, and when you move to another flat, it's yours. So the next person coming in, they just got an empty hole there with the plumbing. This is a, a movement, I suppose you'd say, called minimum existence. You only 
get what you need. Makes sense, doesn't it? You only have as much kitchen as you need, or as much house as you need. Here's Lily here, Lily Reich, and here's her consort, Mies. Does that name sound familiar? Mies van der Rohe. When you see this picture of Lily Reich and Mies van der Rohe, what do you think is happening there? I've been so puzzled by this picture. They look like they're having a good time. <laughs> they're not happy. Well, what's wrong? What happened? What's she thinking? I hate this boat. <laughs> and what's he doing with that pose? He's got his hands in his pockets. Yeah, you women know that pose, don't you? If you're, if you're, you're married to a bloke and you're thinking, what's he, say, what's he thinking? I'm just going to ignore this until it goes away. <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that right? That's what he's singing? Oh, God. Yeah. Now, when people started to develop these flat ideas, of course, in England, who, they love to make fun of everybody. They, uh, 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 an artist called Heath Robinson did a series of cartoons for the newspaper. He wrote a wonderful book called How to Live in a Flat, 1936. And he takes aim at this whole flat idea of super efficient flats, his existence minimum idea. And this is one of his kitchens. You see, everything is collapsible like Lily Reich's kind of kitchen cupboard. The baby's up there, and it what could, looks like a drawer pulled out. Oh, there's a whole range of wonderful illustrations. You find this book in the library sometimes. It's great. Now, we've seen this reductive process taking place. Now we're going to look at the vanishing tasks. What happened to them? Because we're still, still going to cook, aren't we? We've still got to eat. So here we have the kitchen of tomorrow, 1944. So we make all these tasks disappear now. Here this woman is putting her things back in the refrigerator. It looks like it could be iceberg lettuce. And she's got a beautiful little foot pedal there. Springs up. And then when it closes, everything's perfect. It's all neat and tidy, like the back of Ald's um, terraces. Everything's vanished. And digital readouts. No more old-fashioned kind of analog clocks and everything. All there, right before your very eyes. You might guess that this is sponsored by a glass manufacturer. So people are working away and refining things. More machines, devices to make things simpler. This one's a really good one. You put the, just feed the sandwiches in. Imagine this for your children, say. You put the sandwiches in at the beginning of the day, and when they want, they're hungry, you just pull a little latch and comes right around. Here's a, a variation of uh, Lily Reich's uh, kitchen cupboard. This time shown it. Um, 1950. You close everything up with small refrigerators so on. Work well in a flat. But that's really the idea of making the things that these tasks disappear is not such a new thing. Take the Shearer's Kitchen in, in New South Wales. Once the dinner is served for the lovely Shearer's, the lovely cook just folds it up and goes to the next place. Kind of a reductive idea. Appliances, they can do everything. Now, here's another variation on kitchens. I think one that's still very popular and very, very, very much of the moment. I, what I call kitchen as a performance space, where you're active, you're doing the kitchen, you're not tucked away somewhere, you're actually in the kitchen doing something and people can see you, you've got an audience. Like this, the Eternity Theater in Darlinghurst. And you can see up there would be the kitchen in the center stage. And you're doing the work. Now, here's one uh, a kitchen designed by Arthur Ballinson. This is a prefabricated kitchen for a house called the Beaufort House, built in an aircraft factory in, in Victoria. A servery kitchen, which is shaped like a galley kitchen, like, um, like um, Short de Hotsky's, but it has a little servery that's open, so you could be, you could be seen in there. The fourth wall has disappeared. Before this time, the kitchen is a separate space. You go into a door, but that wall then vanishes, and it becomes a performance. Here's an example, another picture of that same kitchen. Very slick for the time. Figure 1945. Not modern appliances all built in and so on. Here's another kind of almost a performance space kitchen. The door, the server has to be slid open. There are lots of jokes about that. This little thing that has to be slid to the side. You recognize this? Nineteen forty five. Designed by Marcel Breuer. Now, Breuer is an interesting character who started off at the Bauhaus as a student and then became a teacher. Just so good. And this is a group of his followers. 
or uh, actually students. Bauhaus at the time, 1928, is probably the first design school to have a very high percentage of women actually in training. Oh, I mean, really high percentage. It changed the whole complexion of the place. This is another variation of that Breuer kitchen. Recognize this one? Same photo, same servery. Here's another beautiful kind of theater in the round performance kitchen. This is a, by Robin Boyd in 1964. This is a great house. You can actually rent this and stay here. It's a beautiful modernist example. You can stay there, use the kitchen the whole bit. And a sort of more contemporary kitchen as performance space idea. But you get the idea. This is the large stage. You're there. You're, you're completely on your own, like an actor. And you're exposed. You have to perform. Now, this is, I think, probably the one of the mainstream trends anyway. This is an ad I took out of the Daily Telegraph just, just last month. And you can see what's happening in these suburban houses that are being advertised there. Look in the back there. What's that called? Can you read that? The Great Room. The Great Room. It sounds like something from sort of Jacobean England, doesn't it? And down at the end of the Great Room is the kitchen. The kitchen has performance space. The audience is here, and there you are on stage. Here's another one in the performance space mode by Alex Zahn, or Zahn Architects. This has been the paper. I'm always reading the Wentworth Courier. I'm really fascinated by what, what you see there. And here we see this is Carlotta Street, Double Bay. This remarkable house, you can see it here. But take a look at the kitchen. The kitchen has performance space. So here we are in the living room, some distance away, several meters away from the kitchen. I mean, quite a distance, really, isn't it? And at, in, your, at the, in the end of your line of sight, at the vanishing point of this room, is the kitchen. And there you are before the audience performing. And here's the other trend. <laughs> the vanishing family. Oh, you're, the, you're laughing. <laughs> Who's looking at your children right now? Do you know where they are? <laughs> the family on a holiday. Now, most recently this book's come out, Cherry Turkle. I encourage you to read it because it, it talks about this same phenomenon of the vanishing family. And why? Well, she's got lots to say about it. It's a pretty big book, but nonetheless, just come out in this year, uh, instant message, email, text, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know all about it. You, you're living it. Now, here's something that might surprise you. This is from the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics 2011. 46% of, uh, of Australian parents that are working when their children are 15 to 17 years old. So you've got kids 15, 17, chances are, are excellent that you and your spouse are working. And when your children come home from school, who's there? The dog? That's about it. You're disappearing. Now, here's the other pressure, the disappearing room. It's not another room. The kitchen can't disappear because we've got to provide food. We've got to do things. We've got to make food. We've got to, have, we've got to do something. It's a bloke's hands. But on the Airbus, where's the food preparation there? So popular is this Airbus and this whole idea of an in-flight kitchen. Then in Taipei, there's a restaurant called the A380 restaurant. Well, you can go pretend like you have an airplane meal. <laughs> think of that. I don't think that Neil Perry had anything to do with the Qantas food preparation. Do you? I mean, really? I've never seen him. NASA, the space shuttle. There's the kitchen. <laughs> but I understand now that they actually have real food on the, on the space station. You actually, have, they prepare real food. Maybe they don't prepare it, but you can eat, you know, green beans. Or you can't have soup. <laughs> now you say, "Well, look, this is crazy," you know, because you still got to prepare food. Well, what I'm suggesting to you is that the food that you know is going to disappear too. But the food that many of you know is going to disappear. And here's an example: corn. 
kind of protein extract grown in a vat. And it just so happens I brought some of this along tonight. I did, and I cooked it before I came here, and I have it outside there on the counter. So when you go out, you can have a look at it. It's lovely. It smells great. The house filled with beautiful aroma. Texturized vegetable protein. Mm, you're already eating this, but you didn't know it. Bako bits, you ever heard of that? You say, well, I, w I wouldn't eat that. That's not real food. But if you, were, if you got it branded and presented in a certain way, you'd eat it. This one, big product, not here yet, but coming. Made by a company called Beyond Meat. Oh, what's Beyond Meat? Soy and pea protein. And it's not pretending to be uh, vegetarian food. It's chicken, but not as we know it. Or this one, you've seen this, it's been around for a long time. Ocean sticks. <laughs> there it is. The future. Now, I'll conclude with this tiny little diversion. I've already said that the nuclear family has re reached a kind of critical mass. But people are still going on with the kitchen because people like, in a way, they like the romanticism of it. And people still like to cook at home. And you might say, well, there's MasterChef and people are really keen about cooking. But I'm saying, statistically, it's just a blip. You know, here's where we are now. This is where people are thinking about kitchens. Not Hannah Tribe, because <laughs> Hannah's got a, got a different aesthetic. But this is, the, uh, this is the latest thing in the kitchen magazines. Sculpture kitchens. He says, here's one in Military Road by um, Tony Owen. See the kitchen down there, the big cabinet going around. You might know this house. Or this one. Kitchen as art installation. This one. You see, again, this is what's on show now. Impossible. Yes, Barangaroo. That should do something, shouldn't it? That big thing <laughs> should, you know, it should turn. Or, or, I don't know, give you a massage, or I don't know. It should do. <laughs> it, it just looks like it should do something. Maybe, it, maybe the top swivels and there's something inside. I, I don't know. It's just a really big thing. But you can see that whole kind of sculptural thing at play. Look at this one, and look at this one. See the soft lines? They're really provided in a way by these, some of these new polymers, which can be shaped really nicely. Sculpture in the kitchen? Anyone eating there? Now, I'm going to conclude. I just, just put up some things here, uh, just some thoughts and ideas, think places where you might go if you're interested in following this along, or you think he's crazy, I'll just read the, I'll read the books and I'll find out he's wrong. B. Wilson, Consider the Fork, uh, just a nice history of, of cooking and eating, just come out. Uh, this Turkle book about Alone Together, which is where I say the nuclear family goes critical. And this one over here, which is uh, Aesthetics of Waste. And up here, this Museum of Modern Art exhibition in 2011, uh, which is probably the last sort of big summary of uh, a design-led kind of literature. Big show, that is where that uh, uh, short to Lahosky kitchen was shown. And lastly, this wonderful book by um, Heath Robinson in 1936. It's available in reproduction. But just to finish it off, this book, Room Plan versus Free Plan, is a a great philosophical study and a visual study of the collision between those two great tributaries of modernism, rooms versus open plan, big room or lots of rooms, the, you know, like the great room. So it's a nice one to look at because it contrasts uh, Adolf Luce, the Viennese architect, uh, with Corbusier, the French architect. So it's a nice kind of struggle, just using that work. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's nice. Don't forget the food outside.
Thank you very much, Michael. I don't know, I don't think I have a performance kitchen. I don't think I have a kitchen as art, but I certainly have hungry teenagers who glare at me when I walk in the door very late every evening. Our next speaker is Hannah Tribe. Uh, Hannah Tribe um, established Tribe Studios in 2003, uh, which is, uh, has been recognized for its design excellence and its built and unbuilt work in residential urban design and interiors. Before that, Hannah worked for a series of award-winning architects in Sydney and New York, uh, where she was involved in art museum design, urban design, and high-end house and apartment design. She's also taught at the University of Sydney, the University of Technology Sydney, and the University of New South Wales. And we're delighted that she's fit us into her very busy speaking schedule. Please welcome Hannah. Thank you, Beth. And thank you, Michael. That was amazing. Um, I'm going to talk about my experiences of kitchen and then illustrate with some um, examples from our portfolio. But to begin, I'd like to um, reminisce. So my most pleasant, golden-hued, slow-motion memories of early childhood are all set in a kitchen with my mum. There's licking the wooden spoon with the meringue mix, helping to chop up ingredients for, for dinner and lots, lots of mixing. And most specifically, there's washing up after the Christmas Day feast. We're in the kitchen of my maternal grandmother in the country. And all the boys, all, all my cousins are all boys, they're all outside playing cricket with the uncles. Except, of course, Uncle Robin, who's asleep in a giant floral chair with his mouth open. And in the kitchen are my mother and her three sisters, rolling up their sleeves and tackling a monumental pile of dishes with great gusto and good cheer. This is the site of gossip that's catching up support during illness and tough times. Stories are shared, women cry, and then they make each other laugh. There's a kind of humorous competitive martyrdom in this family kitchen around workload, and it includes a perverse disinclination to use the dishwasher. And at the end, when everything's gleaming and everything's put away and clean, another year has been given a big, feminine, emotional full stop. I don't want to dwell on why in the 1980s the women had done all the cooking and then proceeded to do all the washing up. Suffice it to say that on any other day of the year, my aunts wouldn't have put up with that for a second, or my mother. Rather, I'd like to concentrate on the notion that the kitchen's on the move. It was a place of nostalgic feminine energy and nurturing energy, it's, but it's now no longer necessarily women in the kitchen. It's also moved physically from the outside of the house to the inside of the house. And along that journey, it's become a strong symbol for domesticity and nurturing, but also for a kind of luxury, glamour, and opulence. I'll give some examples of kitchens from our portfolio of work and finish up with some really pragmatic tips about appliances, materials, and design. So the kitchen is on the move. In Victorian houses, we see the kitchen way out the back, and it's often in a separate structure which hides the work of the kitchen from the formal rooms of the house, and it also stops the kitchen from heating up the rest of the house through the transference of heat through masonry. Here's a kitchen. <laughs> it's the engine room. It's really hidden out the back, and in a modest terrace like this one, the kitchen would have been the domain of the woman in the house, whereas in larger houses, the kitchen was occupied by female servants, and that separation from, of kitchen from the rest of the house was very much about class. Then last century, there's a, another a shot of a familiar house in the Rose Seidler kitchen. There's huge shifts in um, social change and in technology see the kitchen moving inside. So during the modern movement, the kitchen it becomes adjacent to the dining room and it's no longer fully disconnected from the house. The staff have left, mum's in the kitchen, and everyone's pretty proud of the appliances. <laughs> It's still a separate room, it's still a female do domain, but it's conveniently located near the dining room now, and it's full of whiz-bang appliances, making the toil of feeding one's family much easier. Now the kitchen's moved again. It's centrally located, and it's completely open plan. The kitchen is now the focal point of the house, or the performance zone, as Michael said. It's fully open to the living room and the dining room. It's a room on show. 
Its surfaces are often rich and opulent, and its appliances have designer labels. And I think this illustrates a really odd transition in the preoccupations of developers and the market that they're attempting to meet. There's this radical elevation in status of the kitchen. So up until recently, um, developer-driven um, houses, suburbs, um, invested all the detail in finishes and in the public face of the, of the building so that houses were contributing to the streets, making great places to be. So for instance, in a, instance, in a Victorian terrace street, you see all the budget in the house being spent on the front elevation. Or similarly, in a Federation garden suburb, the priority is on the face of the street. And aren't 1950s and 60s bungalows that Robin Boyd would have called featurist and appalling, I think they're starting to look nuanced and interesting um, when they're compared against our contemporary vernacular builds. So the focus now is not on the exterior, it's on the interior of the house and streetscape be damned. And this focus on the interior, I think, is no more keenly applied than to the kitchen. This is the kitchen in the same house. Um, the exterior is all regular off-the-rack items. There's no attention to proportion, not much attention to detail. Big garage door to the street, a couple of classical moments, fibre cement sheeting, which is all fine. It just seems a bit incongruous when you move inside and see the kind of marble castle opulence in the kitchen. Sorry, I need to go back. Um, so there's a modesty to the exterior and a real over-the-topness to the kitchen which I think, in a sense, is a return to the logic of the Romanesque church. The exterior is modest, like the shell of a nut, whereas the interior is a wild opulence of gold mosaic tiles and structural acrobatics. The Romanesque religious metaphor is about spiritual interiority. It's partly church propaganda for the illiterate and probably pretty miserable congregations, and partly a really beautiful idea about escapism, about the spiritual life being better, and about something to look forward to. So back to this house, it has the same diagram. It has a rough hewn exterior shell and it contains a gleaming, polished, refined, bespoke, heavily designed, heavily crafted religious experience, the kitchen. <laughs> so I think this change in kitchen status has coincided with enormous social change and technological change. Socially, there's the obvious change in gender roles. Women are no longer shoved out the back in the kitchen. Imagine in that Victorian terrace house, to do all the food prep and the cleaning labour by hand. Of our clients, I'd estimate that we, in families with children, the lion's share of the cooking is typically done by the dads. Certainly in my home, this is my home, um, <laughs> when we divvied up the chores 50-50, Malcolm bags all the creative and rewarding work of the cooking before I'd even realised what had happened. The other major social change is the focus on cooking. Malcolm grew up in Scotland on a diet of deep fried pizza and warm lager. His mother made a weekly dish called mince, which was just mince. <laughs> it was boiled mince. So my mother's a really adventurous cook, so I was totally mystified to hear about this mince business. But it seems that it was quite common. Did anybody else's mum make mince? <laughs> Um, so the kind of kitchen in which you'd produce mince is very different from the kind of kitchen in which Malcolm serves up thrice-cooked cauliflower and caper salad as just a cheeky Tuesday night meal. <laughs> and it's particularly different from the kitchen in which we prepare huge feasts for large groups of friends. So now our appliances are abundant and they're really whizzy and they do great things. Food preparation is incredibly complex and it's also competitive. It's creative and it's rewarding. But at the same time, we're seeing more instant food and more takeaway. So while people are in their whizzy flash kitchens whipping up pancetta from scratch or cooking cauliflower three times, a more unflattering portrait of many Australians would put them on their sofas, near their flash open plan kitchens, eating McDonald's off their laps while watching Master MasterChef. <laughs> <laughs> or in the words of Michael Pollan, who wrote this excellent book, how is it that at the precise historical moment when we're abandoning the kitchen, handing the preparation of most of our meals over to the food industry, we begin spending so much of our time thinking about food and watching other people cook it on television? 
In this portrait, the kitchen pure, is purely an expression of status. It's a commodity you purchase, and you look at it, and you impress your friends with your whizzy kitchen. It belongs to that trend of real estate agents who name the brand of appliances in, in a for sale ad. The kitchen's the focus of the house's living spaces, and all the clients' excellent taste and in materials and in design is on show in their kitchen. Appliance brand is some kind of reflection of self, like a European car or an it handbag. Or, more flatteringly, this kitchen is the dream of more leisure time. We're all super busy, and dreaming about a new super efficient, really flash kitchen with loads of ingenious labour-saving devices, I think is a kind of dream about more time in which you could cook more and you could nurture your friends, your family and yourself. So the kitchen's a complex little room. It's a space of nostalgic feminine energy, certainly for me. It's a space of nurturing and also of creativity. I think it's a mythical space in which we imagine more time, we imagine a more leisurely future. It's also full of joinery and it's therefore a room really dense with design input, with bespoke details and attention to all the little moments. It's very often the focus of a house and therefore it's where the values of the occupant are expressed most clearly. So in this context, how do we as architects create kitchens? I'll talk about four Tribe Studio projects um, tonight. We very rarely design just a kitchen, so they're all um, kitchens within the context of a greater house design. In a talk I gave recently, I argued that a bespoke house was a kind of portrait of the client, um, that it expresses the personalities of the clients who commission them. So if that's true, then the kitchen is probably the most telling detail in this particular portrait. I'll start with House Boone Murray. This is House Boone Murray. Um, and it was designed for this family. The house is a mixture of charming old bungalow and radical new addition. The linking element in the scheme is joinery throughout, which talks to our clients' interest in modern furniture. And the kitchen is the most significant joinery element in the house. At the functional level, this is a home that's very much about starting and having and raising a young family. One of my major shocks having kids was the degree to which I became housebound. It's my working mother diagram. And more than that, kitchen bound. The shock of going from feeling fully independent and light on my feet as a young adult to being stuck at home blending vegetables and completely tyrannised by the sleeping schedule of a baby was a real shock. So my clients at House Boone Murray and I didn't talk about this explicitly, but our children are the same age. Sally and I are both working mothers, and it became a goal for me during the design phases to make the new extension to their house a real celebration of family life and of the little people living in this place. The windows are designed for playing in. They're for clambering through and perching on and resting. They're designed at heights to be occupied by a child's game or to be a window seat for, for adults. I was really delighted when Tally, Sally told me that she sits in the kitchen window to feed baby Ruthie in a high chair. And the main kitchen window corrects, connects directly with the barbecue area and with the veggie patch right outside. So this is classic contemporary open plan. There are no secrets in this kitchen. So it's really important to have deep double sinks to hide all the dirty dishes <laughs> and a really big butler's pantry. All the windows have specific little goals, but at this time of year I thought I should mention that the window above the sink frames the view of a neighbourhood jacaranda, so that when you're washing up, you can pause for a moment and reflect on the glorious lilac flowers. This is a kitchen that's moved not to the centre of the plan, literally, but to the edge. It's on the threshold of inside and outside, and I think that's quite telling about how this family lives. It's really central to the lives of the clients. It's a pivotal location, this threshold of inside and out. It services an indoor dining room, and it services the outdoor dining room, which is under the olive trees at the back of the garden. The distance from the pantry, the pantry's behind that white door, inside and to the, to the veggie patch outside is the same. So that if you're collecting raw materials for, um, for a meal and you go to the pantry or the garden, it's really the same distance. Um, 
and that's something that's equally likely to happen from the garden or from inside. So this kitchen's a real reflection of how they live every day and, and of how they entertain. It has a kind of generosity. It allows them to go to town for big parties, but it also gives them spaces to hide the mess. It allows them to cook and chat. It's bathed in natural light, hopefully laying down sun-imbued, um, faded memories for the kids as they help cook beside their mums and mum and dad in this kitchen. The next kitchen I'll show is in, in House Chapel, which is this house. It was designed for Kate, whose parents had lived in the house, and her husband, and she has one grown-up daughter living at home. I've drawn Kate with a bit of garden around her, because when we first started work on the project, I'd always leave with some amazing bounty in my hands. So the first time I went, I came away with enough basil to make pesto to keep us going for a year. And the second time, I had two kilos of lime, so we had to drink a lot of gin and tonic. <laughs> she now has a really good beetroot crop on the go, so I'll invite myself over for some of that soon. She's an incredibly warm and generous person, and her kitchen is located right in the centre of her house plan, as if to say that nurturing others is at the centre of her life. Again, this is an incredibly open kitchen, so concealing storage and a space for messy work was key. So that, that, those three doors bifold open, and there's a kind of workspace and, and storage behind. The ceiling over the kitchen soars to a high-level north-facing skylight, and in fact, the highest, most dramatic ceiling in the house is over the kitchen. So it's given the place of the most symbolic importance, which you can see there in section. And this allows a beautiful, warm sunlight to penetrate deep into the room so that the kitchen glows all day long. This kitchen's a real hub in the house. It has all the cooking stuff, but it's also a place for watching TV, for listening to the radio. This is where you get onto the internet and this is where the phone is. So it's a real centre for the informal activity of, a, of an adult family. So it's a classic example of the kitchen literally moving into the centre of the plan. And from this centre radiates all the action of the family and the laughter and the smell of delicious baking. Here's apartment Gregory, which is at Bronte Beach with an amazing view. It's a very small interior project, but it displays all the same principles, but shrunk down to a really minuscule size. It was designed for an incredibly neat, very handsome and well-groomed young professional, who's obviously a Melbourneer. <laughs> <laughs> and the apartment squeezes all the amenity of a terrace into the footprint of a very small apartment. So the living spaces are all in one room, and everything needs to work really hard to earn its place in this one small room. The work surfaces are pushed right up to the rear wall of the apartment. And then on the side wall are a series of sliding, sliding walls that conceal a study, the laundry and wine store, and pantry and fridge. It's a really large kitchen island, which is free from, apartment, from appliances and fixtures. So that can double as a dining table for eight people. And the island has a marble bench top because our client likes to make and roll his own dough and create pastry and bread. On the far wall of the room is a bookshelf which has a full-on bachelor-level audiovisual system, which is concealed. And the TV can be hidden to create a passive lo-fi kind of living space or open to watch television, but the television also swings out on a huge arm so that when Adam's kneading his dough, he can watch telly. But most importantly, and this was a huge part of our brief, that it swivels out the other way so that he can sit on his balcony with a cold tinny of beer and watch the AFL with Bronte's waves breaking in the background behind him. <laughs> so we really loved working on this project. It was for an incredibly chic and design-aware client who was much more concerned with quality than with size. And again, it's an example of the centrality of the kitchen, that the kitchen is a place where Adam cooks for his friends. It is the dining room. It's a place to create things, and that's a pla also a place to relax. So the work of cooking in this house is, le is leisure. The final project I'll show is House Califatus Chilita, which is this 60s bungalow. It was designed for a family with two young girls. There they are, the little fairies. Um, and we basically added a new kitchen, living, dining room out the back, which is a really common kind of Australian renovation, the new living space. Um, 
So there's the connection of new and old. Um, Yvonne and Tony love to entertain. They cook up a huge feasts for their friends. So the kitchen was very important. They wanted a large kitchen that was open to the living spaces with tons of storage and acres of bench space. They wanted it to be sunny and to be central to the house. So getting sun into this south-facing house was a real challenge. So we introduced two courtyards. There's one adjoining the kitchen and there's another one adjoining the ensuite with a high-level window over it that lets sun stream into the living space all day long. Yvonne is an exuberant and generous woman and she's completely hilarious. She sent us, uh, she sent us a lot of emails since she's moved into the house but I just thought I'd share one. We had a big, 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 big party at our house. Nine kids and double that in adults. They all loved, 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 loved the house. <laughs> at one point, I sat on a crate and watched the kids play in the courtyard and in the garden and ride their scooters around the kitchen. I can't explain how that made me feel. We're very blessed. So through all this, what's the tribe team learnt about the ideal kitchen? Here's my team. Um, we think kitchens should, should have tons of storage so that they're easy to clean. And they should be easy to clean so that cooking's not a drag. There should be somewhere to hide the messy bits so you can relax and enjoy food with your family and friend. Friends. I hope you have more than one friend. <laughs> they should have lots of sunlight. And I think there should be an abundant and fragrant herb garden really close by. As for the nitty-gritty pragmatics, I have some advice. Does anyone want to hear nitty-gritty pragmatic advice? Okay. Appliances, you need a good extractor and a good oven. An okay gas top is perfectly adequate unless you cook a lot of Asian food, in which case you need one of two companies who make an excellent um, wok burner with a very high power output. Induction's terrific for cooking, but you need to check that your saucepans will work and also make sure you don't buy a cooktop that will use an exorbitant amount of electricity. We ha when we have clients who do a lot of Asian cooking, we often wind up putting in an induction cooktop and just a single super-duper wok burner. Um, a good extractor is a great in investment and don't skimp on the dishwasher. As for the durability of materials, Polyurethane chips, marble chips and it stains, laminates chip. Granite is almost indestructible, except in extreme cases of heat erosion where it will crack all the way through and for the full length of your bench top. Um, it's also really out of fashion for some reason, I don't know why. Stainless steel scratches and it does really weird things with the re reflectivity of light. Solid timber bench tops require constant maintenance. Timber veneer cabinetry can chip. Solid timber cabinetry costs a fortune. Plywood doors can cup, and some people think they look cheap. Corian is a miracle. All joinery handles will annoy you somehow. If they're too big, they get in the way. If they're too small, they make your hands feel kind of crampy. Finger slots get full of all dropped bits and pieces of food, so refer to easy to clean above. So with that in mind, I think it's worth remem remembering that if you cook, you will damage your kitchen. And therefore, it's best to select materials that age gracefully that register their use in some kind of poetic way, like an old chopping block that's all um, eroded through time and use. So to conclude, I'd like to return to my aunts in the kitchen at Christmas. In an evangelical madness for positive psychology, one of my aunts once argued that the, keys, the three keys to happiness are, one, something to do, two, something to look forward to, and three, someone to love. I feel like you can achieve all of these things in your kitchen. Something to do is the preparation. Something to look forward to is the cake coming out of the oven. And all of this can be shared with someone you love. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hannah. Hannah and Michael, we might invite you to come to the seats in the middle here so that we can have some time for some questions. We just ask you to talk into the microphone, please, since we're recording. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's for Hannah. 
You've given all those very useful suggestions about what to look for, because I'm about to do my kitchen, ex the sort of extension you said, like dining room. What about floor coverings? Please? <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Um, well, your kitchen will get the most wear of any room in the house because we just walk to and fro back on those floor coverings over and over. I like floor coverings. If, if it's an open plan kitchen, I like them to be seamless with the rest of the rest of the room and just accept that they'll be worn more. So if you have timber elsewhere, the timber would be the same. In a lot of apartment design, you see the kitchen with a, with kind of a metre and a half of tiling and then carpet in the rest of the room, which I, I don't know, I feel like it shows a lack of care. But um, in a... For, for my kitchen, I like to have something with a bit of spring in it because you do so much standing up and my poor old knees. <laughs> so uh, timber floor or something that's on a, on a timber frame I think is the, is the most forgiving um, to w work surface. But otherwise it's really just an aesthetic, an aesthetic decision. That wasn't much help, was it? Sorry. Yeah. Other questions in, in the back there? Um, one towards the end, which you said was a miracle, was Corian? Corian is a miracle. I've heard of them. <laughs> probably don't know a lot about kitchens. But I, I don't want to give an ad for Corian here. Uh, I mean, it's not the ABC, but really. Um, <laughs> Corian's a cast acrylic um, material that you can you put this juice on it and it melts together so it can be completely seamless there there's a really beautiful addition to the opera house the new loos in the opera house where there's lots of really sculpted continuous corian so you can almost do anything with it the um it's seamless you can get corian sinks made into your bench top and We've only ever used white. I'm a bit scared about the dark colours, but white doesn't show any scratching. You can give it a really good jiffing. I love jiff. My mum's here. That's genetic. We love jiff. Um, so white, yeah, white Corian's just an amazing material. Really, really durable. Some, some of the sculptural th benches that I was showing are made of that same sort of material. Mm. There's a question over here. Um, firstly, my mother did wonderful things with mints, so I'm <laughs> eternally grateful to her. I'd come home as a 16-year-old boy and tuck into some cold mints. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> so, secondly, um, we don't even have a microwave, but what do you see as the trends in terms of appliances? Somebody showed me something I think called a thermomix the other day, and do you see, how do you see appliances coming? You had an illustration of one to start with, and the, so... Myself? Oh, sort of, uh, because I'm because I'm pitching the uh, the faux food kind of trend. <laughs> I'm I'm seeing a, a sort of microwave convection kind of merge, something to not only heat it up but make it look edible. <laughs> but because I really, I mean, I think perhaps not in the, amongst this audience, but I think that there'll be a lot of people eating that food soon. I really hate. Um one task only gadgets. Do so you can buy a popcorn cooker? It's like, what is wrong with a saucepan? <laughs> really? The, um, and the bread makers. It's like, well, oven. So <laughs> I think there's a real triumph of marketing for its own sake in the kitchen. And you know, there's that mythology that a kitchen saving, labor saving device will turn you into that 50s woman in the little kind of almost kinky apron, smiling wildly into her refrigerator. So, um, yeah, I think less appliances, um, less appliances, more cooking. But that said, Malcolm, you know, 2,000 and something's man in the kitchen making his own sausages. He's got a, a KitchenAid, which is actually amazing. I was like, oh, for God's sake, darling, we've got... A you know, it's ridiculous to have another machine. But that's incredible. He can, it's got all these different attachments. So he can make, knead bread, make cakes. It's got things you can 
make your own mints in. <laughs> oh. I don't know if you can make corn in it, which is disappointing. No, you don't have to make that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Do you think that'll be the next trend? <laughs> make your own corn make. at home? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Make your own baked food. Yeah, yeah it's, a lo- yeah, it's a lovely. <laughs> I already hate microwaves as well, which, are, which is um, a tough thing to say because you can't smell the food. So it's... Mm, so <laughs> but then maybe I'm terribly old-fashioned. <laughs> Hi, thank you. That was a really wonderful uh, talk from both of you. I really enjoyed it. Um, I just have a question about cookbooks. Where do you keep them? In the kitchen or in the study or on display? Do you use them? Do you get food on them? Um, or are they for reading in bed? <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well, I, I want to c- comment about that business because we, we've talked about this at home a, a bit, and we did an exhibition at the Hyde Park Bex some years ago and, uh, called "The Domestic Revolution." We looked at this idea of the computer in the kitchen, the smart, the smart kitchen that told you it was time to buy more milk, and did <laughs> didn't work. But, but, but these new uh, tablets just could. Just could make it, but I have yet to see anyone use one in the kitchen successfully. Have you seen anyone use it? We put computers in all kitchens, oh, little spot for. So I didn't show any of those. A little desk for a computer or somewhere to have a tablet, and um, a lot of people are cooking off their iPads, you know, Taste.com and all there those things. And then I don't know. I'm going to do it, put another plug, honestly. I don't have shares, but Harris Farm Online, amazing. So you just just click on things on the iPad and you don't even have to write a list and you've put in an order. So that's changed the way we use technology in the kitchen. So maybe to answer the question about appliances, I think the iPad is the best new appliance. Um, but then there's nothing like that tactility of a, of a cookbook. You know, the, your grandmother's recipes of... Our mum had a has a recipe book from when she was sixteen, and has a recipe for fudge in it, and the which is amazing, teeth meltingly amazing. And that page is all you can always find that page because it's so wrinkled and it's crusted with you know ancient bits of fudge. Yeah. And I don't think there's any replacing that. So the cookbooks have to be in the kitchen; they have to be allowed to get dirty. And that's um, mm. a part of part of that really analog nostalgia that goes with eating and cooking and having friends and family. Yeah, I could just comment on that idea about the, tab- the tablet thing. If that um, uh, spoken voice software works well, like Siri, then th- there could be a real opening there for your tablet. Could, one of the problems is about getting food all over. As you could say, uh, mother's fudge recipe. Next page. It would need an audio. It would have to come up with the crinkle. <laughs> ripping, <laughs> ripping the pages Maybe apart. some <laughs> smell. <laughs> <laughs> I use my um, iPad in the kitchen along with mm. a leftover prop from that exhibition you were talking about, an old-fashioned hand oh. beater. There was, a, there was a box of sort of things left over, and I picked that up, and I still, I still use it all the years later next to my iPad. So, you who knows? <laughs> Anything's possible. So, a question over here. Um, hi. So, I'm, I'm Lisa. Thank you so much for your talk. Now, I recently went to Singapore to visit some friends. And I was really astonished that they had an indoor and outdoor kitchen, a wet and, I think it said a wet and dry kitchen. And so what they do apparently is that for all the really hot cooking, they do it outside. Mm-hmm. Now I was thinking back here and how you know we now have really elaborate barbecues for outside. So I wanted to hear from you about how you, you know, if you're getting those sort of questions, how do you use the indoor outdoor more functionally? I think this goes to Michael's, um, in, in an Australian context, to Michael's idea about the performance of cooking. And certainly the barbecuing of meat outside has always been a kind of man performance. You know, it's been fire and a big slab of raw animal. Stick. And the man takes it outside. And the woman's been inside chopping up and marinating for hours and cleaning. <laughs> and, blah, 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 blah. and the man goes out and beats his chest and <laughs> fires the animal. And that outdoor kitchen is turning into, that outdoor barbecue alone is turning into a full kitchen. And we're putting dishwashers outside and we're putting fridges outside. So there's a whole man performance because men cooking now is not about chucking a slab on the barbecue. It's about, you know, doing really like plating salmon and stuff. I mean, it's become 
um, more about fine motor kitchen toil, <laughs> not just, which was traditionally women's toil, not just chucking a slab on the barbie. So I think there's, there's a trend there to always have a man's kitchen and a woman's kitchen in a way. But um, also we all just like to be outside all the time. So if you're outside at a dining table outside and you're cooking for your friends, it's fabulous if you can do it all there. But then that goes back to the success. Like to have two full kitchens um, seems absurd, especially when everything that goes into an outdoor kitchen has a very short life. But it's great for hot things in a hot climate. I, had, mm. I hadn't actually thought about it in those terms. Mm. To, you know, Because certainly, I mean, that Christmas lunch that we had was, wasn't hot for very many years. Because cooking in December is just gruesome. Crazy. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. It was great um, to hear both of those presentations. I just was curious to hear from both of you your thoughts um, about the future of the kitchen, particularly as we've talked about this idea of art installation um, and the fact that it is, at the moment, the center of the house. It seems to me we've gone from kitchen behind closed doors and we're almost back to kitchen behind closed doors with the idea of the butler's pantry, etc. And if you ever sort of see that trend happening, so as it becomes pure sculpture, does everything in the kitchen go back into a separate room? Or are we going to continue to see this um, growth of things hiding behind closed doors, some being out in the open? Just curious on your thoughts and ideas of what's happening there. We, we see that there is a kind of perversity, isn't there, to having an open plan kitchen which is all about sharing everything but then you build this almost second kitchen where you can hide all the messy parts in the butler's pantry. We do that a lot. And, and also the, it goes back to the, the kitchen in the cupboard that you just hide the, you hide the machinery of the kitchen when the space converts to a kind of lo-fi, low gadgetry level of comfort and then you open it up again when it's all whizzy. Um, so I think um, kitchens are, we're cooking a lot less and I think kitchens in apartments and inner city space where real estate's at a real premium will continue to shrink down to almost nothing. Um, and, but I think in suburban homes and luxury homes that idea of performance and the idea of status in the kitchen because it's such an expensive room and it's an opportunity to have all these amazing materials and bespoke design, I think that will continue to be front and centre. Um, and I think the, the leisure time to cook um, is, is, another, is another way that people show off, so it's going to continue. <laughs> um, but it's also a way of, of entertaining and, and, and how we communicate with one another. On commenting, I, I agree with Hannah in, in lots of ways, but, but I think that um, the exclus exclusivity of the kitchen will belong to a, a very small segment of the market. And a, as the real estate ads show, and if you flip to the telly on the weekend, you can see that the plans show this kitchen is just going... And it's in flats, as you point out, it's magnified. That effect is magnified. And I suspect in, in the end, if we went to Singapore, Oh, you'd find uh, kitchens and flats are, are just really just a cupboard and people are eating downstairs. They're getting their meals there. So my, my trend is driven by economics because open plan one, I think the battle's been won there. Like the great room is a fact. And it's easier to build, cheaper. You don't have to put a wall in. It's just one big space and you just put the kitchen at the end. It's a lot less money even for, for real estate developers. I think it's uh, under huge threat in, in the mainstream, but then there'll always be this beautiful segment of the market where you can show your creativity. And Hannah mentioned a beautiful thing when she was talking about dreaming and leisure. You could stand in this beautiful space and imagine that you had time to do something there, even when you don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Hannah and uh, Michael. Great talk. Um, I spent the weekend packing up uh, or getting my mother's house for sale in Adelaide. And it, we'd lived in the house for 50 years. 
and seven children, and I thought to myself as we were scrubbing that kitchen and getting it up to kind of sale, um, to get it sale potential, that how many dinners had been cooked for um, five hungry boys and two hungry girls. And I thought to myself, very little change had been made in this kitchen. You know, it has got an added microwave and, you know, but a very basic stove and, and the rest of it. And I thought to myself that Australian obsession with changing the kitchen every, I mean, Hannah, you might know every seven years or eight years, and what that means in terms of waste, <laughs> you know, for, for us as a, you know, in terms of sustainability and the rest of it. And I wondered what, in, from your experience, how often are people changing their kitchens and um, why do we do it? Because it seems to be an Australian obsession, renewing the kitchen and bathroom. Um, I've heard that statistic as well, that it's on average every seven years, which just seems appalling, uh, especially when you think of all the toxic glues that go into um, standard kitchen joinery. Um, so in, we do a lot of um, kind of substantial renovations to old houses and if there's a kitchen that's from the 20s, it's fine. It's, it's still in perfect work, working order. The, uh, even the hinges will usually still work. So there's that sense that we've lost a quality and craftsmanship. So if a, ki but a kitchen from the 80s is completely cactus. So 60 years older and it just won't, won't go anymore. The laminate's peeling off, the um, nickel hinges are all gone. It's so I, I think that's really appalling, that we build with, with this sense that we, we know we will have to knock it out. If not in seven years, then certainly in 15, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be past its use-by date. Um, so, and I don't, I mean, we can, I don't know how you insist on better quali quality cabinetry. <laughs> it's something we try to do with our clients, but um, it's, it's a real niche market. Mm. <laughs> got no experience in that area. Hi, um, my question follows on quite well from that one, really, and it's very it's sort of a, um, a boring question in a way, but I'm looking at thinking of cost. And probably it's a question for you more, Hannah, in terms of if you uh, was, to, was to sort of average the cost of those four kitchens that you, uh, case, you know, that, that you showed us tonight, what do you think that cost would be, excluding the design component, so the actual cost of those kitchens, if you were to average it out quickly in your head? I'm pleased you excluded the design component because obviously that's enormous. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, the last one I showed was very big, but it also had a real modesty in its material palette. And I think um, that, was, that would have been a $30,000 kitchen plus appliances. Um, and then the, some of them do difficult things structurally, so they become more expensive. Then, but we would normally say um, the, the cheapest kitchen I've ever put in was for uh, my own house <laughs> and there was $5,000 worth of joinery and my husband will never forgive me for the rubbish oven I put in it. Oh. Um, so it can be done very economically. That's just the joinery and then the appliances are an additional cost. But the houses we do for, um, for clients are usually upwards of $30,000 and anywhere up to, you get lots of beautiful solid timbers and things that can be $100,000 just in joinery cost for the kitchen. But there's a lot of, there are a lot of, builders call them personal choice items, PC, PC items, where you, you can really control the cost of a kitchen. No more questions? Well, please join me in thanking our speakers tonight. Thanks. Thanks very much. Really, really wonderful talk. And um, oh, here's my notes about next week. I was looking for those earlier. Next week will be our final um, talk in this series. I will be looking at those other rooms, from smoking rooms to man caves and everything in between. It sounds absolutely wonderful. With Megan Martin, who is our head of collections and access, and Mike Scott, the managing director of the Treadstone Company. So I hope you'll join us then. There's a few little bits and pieces on your seats. I hope you can find time to join us at some of our other properties and events. And thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>